Good evening, baseball fans. It is a Sunday, June 9th. This is Bourbon and Baseball, Astros edition. I'm Susie. That is Tom. Am I? Oh, there you are. Am I pointing the right way? I never know which way. You are point. pointing the right way. I'm pointing the okay. wrong way. That way. Okay, so that's Tom. I'm Susie. This is Bourbon and Baseball, Astros edition. We're going to do the rated R warning right up the top because even though we won the series, it still feels awful. So there's here's the rated R warning. There, there will be cuss words. There will be lots of four-letter words in this episode. If that's not your jam, totally okay. Go find the Astros in Orbit on the Top Fan Rivalry Network. You will find PG-13 Susie over there. Over here on the Bourbon and Baseball Show, though, you're going to get rated R Susie, rated R Tom as well, and all of the cuss words, probably some inappropriate adult humor. Again, if that's not your jam, that is okay, but this is, it is what it is. And unfortunately we're not going to change unless you start paying us. No, even then probably not with that. We're going to, we're going to roll into it. And if I had the money, Tom, I would have played the really sad Sarah McLaughlin music with the, when they do the puppies and all in the arms of the angel, I will not sing and save everybody. (laughs) That's what I was going to play because even though, again, like I said, we won the series, this last game was just a gut punch and I almost wish that not that we would have lost the series like that would have been better but that it would have been a blowout to begin with I think maybe is that just is that just my feeling or am I just weird I know I'm weird but it's not just your feeling for the fans I saw plenty of reaction where people said the exact same thing that you did for me though I feel like that's a new fan thing not an old fan thing I feel like the guys that have been riding with the Astros since the 45s on your hat would be like, all right, I got to rein it in. But this is the level of success that the Astros have had over the last six, seven years. So you just feel like they're not allowed to let you down. And today was a big letdown because multiple leads, everything was set up for a series sweep. And just, we are so back and everybody wants so bad to just from the rooftops, the Astros, baby, World Series back on, and it could be, but you're not going to, it's, sweeps are hard. I can't stress enough. Teams just don't operate like you would hope they would. Like, no, I want to win every game. No, they don't do that. They get to a point where they're like us, right? Like you go to work and you have good work days, good work weeks. And some days you're just like, look, I know I'm not that person. And today you're just going to get good, but not great Susie or good, but not great Tom. And then it's, hey, you got good but great me two days ago. You should be happy I'm here at all. And I feel like the Astros kind of did that today. I don't want to name names, but there's certain players. We'll get into it. Oh, no, we're going to name names. We're (laughs) going to name names. Don't you worry about that. This is an accountability pod. It's not a math pod, but it is definitely an accountability pod. Or if you knew we're out here just because I'm Asian doesn't mean I can do the maths, okay? That's not who I am as a person overall, much to the chagrin of my mother. Anyhow, so guys, we did, we won the series. That is what we definitely need to take away. We will get into this last game. I know it's super fresh in our minds because obviously we just had it, but do not let this cloud the fact that on, I was going to say Monday, not on Monday, guys. On Friday night, Fromber, complete game. Almost to Maddox. I think he threw 106 pitches, 105. What is a Maddox for the people that don't know? A Maddox is a complete game in under 100 pitches, and that is in reference to Greg Maddox, who apparently did some crazy thing and threw a complete game in 81 pitches. That is absolutely insane. And so it's apparently he had a lot of those, and that's what it's named after. So if you're new to baseball, newer baseball fan, i.e. me, now you know. Atlanta Braves, great Greg Maddox. If you're looking for him, go look at the Atlanta Braves. Back when the Astros were in the NL, they, like, tormented the Astros. It was a a constant they meet up in the playoffs and they were big brother the Astros were little brother and they just beat them up Biggio Bagwell era they could tell you stories forever about Smoltz Glavin Maddox great three three three-headed monster that was the Atlanta Braves in the mid-90s so if you were not on the PSF app with Tom and I you missed a great discussion because we had a whole big discussion about this and I didn't know if it was a complete game shutout that was considered a Maddox or if it could just be a complete game while still giving up some runs. So I found out that it could be just a complete game, one that you just throw all by your onesies. And Fromber did that. And after the first start with the Angels, where he basically imploded on himself, going 
literally all the innings and only giving up a single run was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Now, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Victor Caratini had to get that train back on the tracks a couple of times. A couple of times. And we'll talk about that, too. Because I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure that Victor Caratini will now be Fromber's quote-unquote pers personal catcher. Only for the sole fact that he can rein him in. And I don't believe Fromber respects the honor enough to listen to him. So, there's that. Second game, Hunter Brown, look at you go, sir. Quality start. We love that. Not giving up runs in the first, second inning. Also, great. We didn't squander this one. Yay, Astros. Hooray. You did the things. Although, you did the things while still giving me some gray hairs. It can't be simple. No, of course not. We need the drama, right? Astros, bullpen. But let's go game by game. Let's start on Friday. Friday night. Fromber versus, why am I blanking on the name? Griffin Canning. There we go. And for a little while there, it was a pitcher's duel. It was a pitcher's duel. Griffin Canning was sitting us down pretty easy as well. It was not the Astros that we like. The Astros that are taking at-bats, taking pitches in at-bats, working at-bats. There we go. And it was getting a little hairy there for a little while until when? I'm like, that was two days ago. So the I don't seventh to inning it was one, one going into the seventh inning. And then we said, JK, we're done. We're done messing around now. Let's do this. Started with Jose, uh, Jose Altuve with a single moving cabbage to second. And then Jordan with a double and cabbage scores. Altuve scores. Or Diaz. Hits a yeah, home run, hits uh, another home run, and that would have been was that the three and was that the third in a row? I believe that was the or was that second in a row? You're talking about of the four? I thought that, yeah. I think that was the third of the row. Third that in a row. was the third. Okay. So <clears throat> Yiner hits a home run, and then guess what, guys? Guess who <laughs> hit another home run? Guess who? <laughs> Your favorite first baseman ever Not for John Houston Singleton. Astros. <laughs> Not John Singleton. Not Yuli Gurriel. That's right, guys. <laughs> Jose motherfucking Abreu hit a home run. And I almost wanted him to be like cocky and do the Carlos Correa time celebration. Be like, I think your average oh, has to be over it. 200 before you can start doing stuff like that. I would have loved, loved it. I would have loved it. I will say this it was for, for people that, you know, want to find something wrong with it because I just can't, he can't be good. Everybody, there's a, not everybody, there is a section of fans that just want him strapped to a rocket and it does not matter what he does. They will look to find ways to tear it down. This was 105.5 miles per hour off the bat, 401 distance with a 24 degree launch angle angle. Sorry. Words are hard today for some reason. Um, hard. So this was a, a legit Homer and to right center where his power can be. I think when he was in his prime right center was where he wanted to go with a lot of things. So of course, everybody was like, well, he didn't pull the baseball. He can't pull the baseball. He's not doing anything good. And it's just like, shut up. Let him have it. Now, I will I will say it was on a it was on an 85 mile an hour slider. So for those that want to bitch, you are correct. It was on a breaking ball, man. And how many sliders give everybody freaking fits on this team? So let's give credit where credit is due. It was on an 85 mile an hour slider and down and away. It wasn't a way away. I, obviously, Ronzi Contreras missed the spot. Or maybe they just underestimated Jose Abreu. Maybe a little of, of each. Who knows? But it happened, people. It happened 7-1. to one. That was the final score. It was great. It was wonderful. And we loved it. We did. We loved it. But what we didn't love was the fact that our guys were not taking the greatest at-bats. They weren't. I think that game, literally Jose Altuve saw, I went back and I looked, six pitches. Four of those were in the first, first at bat. And then literally every at bat afterwards, he's like, nope, I'm going to just, I'm going to swing at the first one. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do on the first one. <laughs> Altuve, I love you. I love you, my short king. But can we not? Can we work something? Because Griffin Canning has 50 pitches in the fifth inning. Let's, let's work a, let's work an AB. No? Cool. Okay love that but it's Altuve you can't for as much as we whine and complain about Altuve 
Then he goes and hits, I think, what was it a double? In that game, it was just a single. It was like, oh, just, just a single. Just yeah. a single. But on six pitches, he finally took one and, and put it in play like, like he does. And I don't even think it was like a pitch that he probably should have swung at. But when Jose Altuve has it in his mind that I'm committing to whatever this is, he's got a special talent to be able to put that in play. And I feel like that's our frustration, right? We see everyone else try to emulate what Altuve does. And that's how a guy like Griffin Canning, who's not good, can have given up one run over five innings with 50 pitches. So that's the fear is that guys get up there and they just try to jump on the first pitch. Alex Bregman trying to jump on the first pitch. I think Bregman, when he's at his best, he's sitting on a 3-2 or a 2-2 count going, I know you're going to bring it to me. And he's Mm -hmm. waiting for it. And it's like when he comes out swinging at the first thing, I always feel like it's not the pitch that he should swing at. Yeah. So Altuve hit an 88 mile an hour changeup that was inside, low and inside to him. He hit it 96 miles an hour. It went 110 feet at a seven degree launch angle. I, Altuve, I love you, my short king. You are amazing. And that moved Trey Cabbage to second. And then Alex Bregman worked a walk. And then Jordan doubled. Is this the game that we saw the, what's his bucket? No, it was not. That was the second game. Their version of Mason Miller, not as good. Ben Joyce. No, second game. Yeah, that was the second game. So Alex Bregman, though, getting his stroke back just a little bit, hitting some walking, working at bats, looking more like the Bregman that we know and love versus the whatever crap bag that he has been the first couple of months of the season. There is still time to salvage some sort of contract, Alex Bregman. Just a little (laughs) bit. Just a little bit. But that was awesome. We love that. Everyone was coming for Yiner. Everyone was coming for Yiner about, oh my gosh, how he sucks. And y'all, see, this is why Dusty Baker didn't play him last season. Blah, blah. Spare me. Spare me, people. The league adjusted to him. He came out firing and literally did all of the things. And the fact that he has now the primary catcher, what organization failed to prepare him for everyday catching duties? I wonder. I wonder. Okay. I don't know how anyone expected Maldi to try and mentor him when the mentor does all the fucking work that's not how mentors work people it's not that's not how any of that works the league adjusted to yiner yiner has now adjusted back and it's a give and take i was gonna i was gonna say a give and go and that's not a that's not that's a whole other wrong thing. sport <laughs> that's a and it's a give and take league adjusted I'm- him he adjusted back and now obviously He's seeing pitches in the zone and he's not taking these wild hacks outside the zone. And I think that's probably the biggest point of the adjustment is that he's not wildly swinging outside the zone any any longer. He still is because he's Yiner, but not as much. I think the other thing too, he got a day off. He got a couple of days off. And then they had a day off. So that was like two days in a row. They really spoke to, he did his post game. They really spoke to how much it takes to prepare to catch a lot of these guys and how that's where a lot of his focus was. And he took some of what he does to get prepared to hit and put that on the back burner to be a better catcher. And I think for him, I think he he was able to DH a game. So that kind of helped him. And then you give that dude some time to just get his mind right. And then all of a sudden you've got a totally different monster who's just locked back in at the plate and a good catcher. So shout out to Yiner for really turning it around because you're going to need guys like Yiner to do the things that he can when Bay doesn't have it that day, when Briggs doesn't have it out that day. Because they're just not going to – I feel like the best version of the Astros is on the days when those guys don't have it, the bottom of the lineup picks it up. Or maybe it's a Chaz day or maybe it's a Myers day. So often we, we depend heavily on Bregman, Tucker, Jordan, Tuve, where these other guys being able to come in and spell them offensively is just going to make this team get back into this race so much faster. Absolutely. And – IL update. Unfortunately, Kyle Tucker did go on the IL retroactive to the fourth, I believe. It is a right shin contusion. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a, just a horrible, horribly deep bone bruise. He was on two crutches. Now he's down to one crutch. Apparently, he didn't want that getting out, but Julia spoiled that. And when Brian McTaggart asked him if 
maybe he would consider wearing a wearing like the catcher's gear, like leg armor. I almost said warmer. It's not warmer. Leg protector. Leg. What word did you just say that I totally overspoke? Armor. Armor. Okay. Yeah. He's like, or maybe I just stay inside the ball a little bit more. Sure. Tucker, <laughs> do that. But just in case, can we put another shin something higher? Maybe some bubble wrap. Also, can we bubble wrap the entire fucking team? All of them. Jordan, Briggs, Tuve, all of you. Pena, all of them. Just bubble wrap them all. Unfortunately, Christian Javier, Jose Arquiti are out for the rest of the season with Tommy John, if you hadn't heard. And that is an update because apparently it was just elbow surgery, but it is updated too. They both did have to have Tommy John. So we will not see them. And Fromber apparently told Christian Javier that he was going to do something good in honor of Christian Javier. And I love that. That makes me a little happy inside. It warms my cold, dead heart that the guys love each other so much and wanted to pick one another up. Side note, did you see Jose Arquiti's wife's Instagram update? I do not stalk the women of Astros players like you do. So the answer okay. is no. I probably should so I could answer these questions better. I just don't know if I'm going to do it. Though. Okay, that's fair. That is fair. So that's why you listen to said podcast. So you don't have to follow all of the players' wives. So Estefania, Jose Arquiti's wife, they apparently were pregnant in May and unfortunately had a miscarriage. And right after they found out about the miscarriage, they found out about Jose's arm. So it was not a pleasant May for their Urquidy family. So for everyone that is cooking Urquidy and saying, oh, it doesn't really matter and blah, 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 blah. We say all these things. They are human beings with actual lives, with actual feelings. And we don't know what's going on in their personal lives 99% of the time. Just be kind because, again, you don't know what's going on in people's lives 95% of the time. Those are the IL updates. The corresponding move for Kyle Tucker was Joey Loperfito. Joey Loperfito is up. Unfortunately, Joey Loperfito didn't get into any games for the Angels, though. And asked when asked if he would get any time at first base, Joe Espada hedged around it, didn't really answer the question, but essentially said no. <laughs> I love it. So good. There's game one. Game two, Hunter Brown, like I said, did a marvelous job. Was a little erratic, not gonna lie. And had to get brought back onto the rails a couple of different times, but he did it. Him and Yiner worked beautifully together. And his fastball velocity was up almost a mile and a half. And I wonder how much of that is adrenaline versus actual technique and tweaks mechanical tweaks like that tweet i had sent you about Yoshi yoshinobu yamamoto if you guys don't know if you guys don't follow ben brewster you guys should because that is a whole wealth of knowledge that i only understand two percent of what he actually tweets about but there was a great tweet about yoshinobu yamamoto who is a pitcher for the dodgers and how he gained velocity on his fastball and it had to do with the angle of his glove and at first i was all that is the stupid, well, I don't understand why that would make any difference at all. And then he broke it down, essentially how, and he likened it to when bigger shaders bring their arms in and they go faster. You'll have to, I will link the tweet so that you can read this, but that's essentially like what it is, that that motion somehow works with your centrifugal force and all that fancy big words and increases velocity on all. I was not aware that the angle of someone's glove would do that. Now I need someone to break down Hunter Brown's start and see if there's if there was some sort of like mechanical adjustment that was made. Is he holding his glove in a different manner? Is that why? I think he's being mentored by Justin Verlander. And I think like Justin Verlander, he's able to go to another gear if he needs it. JV has always been able to get you 97, 98. It's always in his back pocket, but he doesn't live there. He'll live 94, 95, 96, and then ratchet it up towards an end of a start or in a big moment, key moment, when he needs a little bit extra to get that, that, that heater just past a hitter. 
And I think that's what Hunter's doing. I don't know that there's anything mechanically that's, that's changed for him. But if there is, I'd love to hear it. I don't know. He ended that inning or that outing with a 98 mile an hour fastball, I want to say. So he started the outing with essentially a 98 mile an hour fastball and ended it. So he had it in the tank. And it was, like I said, it was pretty nice. It was a great start for him. Almost everybody in the lineup had a hit besides Abreu. I'll say yes. So Altuve had a Altuve had multi hit. Altuve had two hits. Went two for five. Jordan uh, Jordan is Jordan, and went three for four. Pena had a hit. Yiner had a hit. Myers, Dubon, McCormick. Is this the game that McCormick tripled in, or was that today's game? No, this was the game. Got the scoring started. So, yes, that was in the top of the third. The, oh, remember when I said Hunter Brown was wild? We had to get him back on track. Yeah, the bottom of the first, he loaded the bases. Loaded the bases, and I'm all, oh, this is this is perfect. Hunter <laughs> Brown, what are we doing? But Matt Dye strikes out swinging, love that. And then Chaz McCormick starts the top of the third with a triple, and he's looking a little bit better. He's looking a little bit more locked in. I think the key to Chaz McCormick is he's going the other way. When Chaz is at his best, everything's going the other way. The triple, the other way. Today, a lot of stuff he was doing was the other way. In the offseason, he talked about trying to be more of a pull hitter to counter what pitchers were doing to him Mm -hmm. because he was taking a lot of the stuff that they were throwing to him away and taking it and going with the pitch. Well, now he felt like they were crowding him in, so he couldn't do that, so he wanted to pull a little bit. So now he made the adjustment back. And since he started doing that, you're just seeing a well-rounded Chaz McCormick the last couple of games. And I think that has a lot to do with it. We say that. However, apparently there were some missed bunts today that I don't... We're just going to pretend like we don't see those. Okay. We're, that's what we're going to do. Because I really need Chaz McCormick to get right, people. I'm going to hold him accountable. I need him to get right, though. Let's see. Jordan hit a home run in the top of the fifth. And now we're at 4-0. Nolan Shanuel, is this the one where he was doing his, yeah. Nolan Shanuel hit a 96 mile an hour fastball above the zone. It wasn't super far out the zone, but it was barely a strike that Montero threw. It wasn't a strike. It was up around his neck. It was a ball. It was just his best Altuve impersonation. Yeah. It, but the fact that we scored in again, multiple innings and not all in one inning, like we had been doing. Also, great signs. Great signs. And then we get to today's game. So today's game, if someone comes to you, Tom, and says, hey, we got these three pitchers going. Of these three pitchers, which game do you think we would possibly lose? I gave you Fromber, Hunter, and JV. Which game of these three would we lose, Absolutely the guy with the best record against the Angels. That'd be Justin Verlander in 14 games against the Angels. He's 10 and three with, I think it was like a 2.8 something, 2.83 ERA. So absolutely Justin Verlander. So, but JV did not have it today. And some days you don't, some days you don't. But the fact that he still went out and grinded and gave us four innings, five innings, five innings, five innings, five innings. And I was only able to listen to the broadcast. I wasn't able to watch the game. So after this recording, I will go back and actually like physically put eyeballs to the game. I know I'm a horrible host that didn't do her research. I know, but you guys don't pay me. When you start paying me, I'll watch all the games, literally with my own eyeballs. But the fact that he went out and grinded and then Joe Espada went out and talked to him. Was he going to take the ball? In the fourth inning the, uh-huh. or the yeah it looked like i don't think it looked like he was going to take the ball but i think he wanted to make sure that he knew hey this is it empty the tank right here and then they let him go and it, it worked out like i said i was listening to the, the radio broadcast and sparky was saying that his fastball velocity was down a couple of ticks and he was attributing it to the fact that the last time out jv hit triple digits with his pitch count and this was the first start back. And so he may be going through a little bit of a dead arm period. Did they mention anything on the TV broadcast, Tom, about JV's velocity being down? 
No, because it didn't stay there. It started the first couple of innings around 91, 92. And that's when they were making like a big deal. Cause I, I heard some of the radio broadcasts too. And then in the middle innings, like the second or not the second, but the third, fourth, and then the fifth, his fastball got up to 94, 95. So they were, eh, maybe it was just him trying to get into the start a little bit. Maybe it was something that he was working with. He had thrown a lot of uh, change-ups. So maybe that was something that he was trying to play off of a little bit. So. Yeah, a lot of breaking stuff. A lot of breaking stuff today. Change-ups, lots of curveballs, lots of spin. So the Angels, it, it looked like we were going to be, it looked like we maybe, just maybe, we could pull off this sweep, guys. Just maybe. And that would have been great. That would have been great. Because why, Tom? I know it's your favorite part of the segment when we talk about the standings. But it would have been great if we were able to pull off the sweep. Because why? Because did both the Rangers and the Mariners lose last night? And we were able to gain ground? Yes. yes. Yep. Yep. Did both the Mariners and Rangers win today? And guess who lost today? The Houston Astros. Love that. Love that. So good. It's so good. So, the top of the third, Mauricio Dubon walked. Jose Abreu singled, and then Chaz McCormick struck out. Wait, and who was that? Who was that guy you, you named? The second guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's that? Okay. You, okay. you heard you heard that correctly. Just Jose Abreu, and hand up. I put out a tweet saying, "You know what? We've already won the series. It would have been nice if." John Singleton could have been getting into a game at least, let alone starting a game because this is his hometown, not his hometown, but this is home base for them. This is where they live. Over a hundred friends and family were there to cheer John Singleton on, on the fucking bench. I have mixed feelings. Hindsight is 2020 because Jose Abreu did come up clutch, did come up clutch, hand up. That's my crystal ball was broken. Didn't see that one coming. I would have loved to see John Singleton today. Not saying that John Singleton wouldn't have been able to do this, but nowhere on my bingo card did I have Jose Abreu doing this. And it just would have been nice. It would have been nice. That's all I'm saying. Jose Abreu hit a single on a, guess what? 87 mile an hour slider. So he got on base and then Chaz struck out. And I said, Chaz, what are we doing? What are we doing? Because he struck out on a 96 mile an hour fastball. And it was in, it was up and in a little bit. And there was one at bat where he just ate it. Middle fastball just struck out. And he was crushing those last season. I was mad. I was mad. Last season, he was locked in and he was crushing those. At no point in time would you have even dared to throw a middle fastball. Unless like it's an elite middle fastball. Not a Patrick Sandoval middle, middle fastball. And he was crushing it. And he was not. Alex Bergman doubled though. Oh, excuse me. Jose Altuve singled. This was... Jose Altuve's 100th, where he 100th. hit. What was the stat? What was the was it the multi hit the multi hit game or something like that? Is that what that was? I want to say it had something to do with that. Okay. I don't have it. I don't have it. Like memorize. Think, How yeah. dare you, Tom? How dare you? I know it's all my fault. Again, this is the shoddy. This is the shoddy reporting that you guys get from this podcast. I <clears throat> so apparently, Anaheim Stadium is. He broke some record. It was like a hundred multi-hit game, I think. Somebody fact check me. Put it in the YouTube notes if you were able to watch this game. And they, I'm sure they had lots of graphics up. Please let me know in the comments, in the YouTube comments. If you have not subscribed to YouTube, what are we doing? Hit the big red button. We would love you forever. Please and thank you. Do it. Yes, please. Jose Altuve singled. We score a run and then Alex Bregman doubles and we love that. And now that's two to one. And now... Patrick Sandoval says, I'm not even fucking with Jordan Alvarez. We're just going to put Jordan Alvarez on. In, I want to say, were there no outs at that point in time? I thought there was one out because there Chaz was one out. out. Yeah. yeah there was one out. out and the game was two to one. And it's the top of the third. And they're like, you know what? We're not, we're not even going to fuck with it. Jordan, just go. Just go. Probably one of the best things they could have done. Probably. But then Jeremy Pena said, okay, cool. You want to throw me? Let's do it. And he hits an 89 mile an hour slider. Guess what? Patrick Sandoval, you missed your spot. That was supposed to be low and away. He goes after the low and away ones. He said, nah, this one's going to be middle middle. 
he hit that. Three to one. Three to one now, but the bases were loaded with only one out, and then Yiner grounded into a double play. Wah, wah. I was like, cool. Okay. That's not upsetting at all that there's only one out and the bases are loaded and we only get one. But that's, that's fine. That's okay. That's okay, right? We need insurance runs, people. Insurance runs. Let's see. Jake got a single. Apparently, JV just wanted to hit all of the angels. He tried. He, he didn't tried. walk anybody. He's like, if you're going to get on, you're going to earn it. You're going to wear it. Which somebody took exception to it. Who took exception to it? Was Kevin, was it Kevin Pilar? I think so. It was. He took like an extra, like a beat to stand there and just, he didn't really do anything. He just stared off into space. He didn't really look at JV and JV, like JV's body language just looked, man, my bad. He didn't say it, but it just looked like it. And Pilar just stood there and he's like slowly started taking off his stuff and he's like standing there and then he walked down. But it was like one of those, all the things were said would, no words okay all right so i i will give it to i will give it to the angels the angels battled back they did they they did they battled back because in that inning willie calhoun singled then there was the hit by pitch by kevin pilar and then logan hoppy singled and now the score is three to one and then nolan shanuel hit a sack fly and now it's three to two and then jv hits zach netto now but that one though was that one an actual hit by pitch or was it like a barely got so, a jersey? I thought thing? I thought he hit the, the knob of the bat because like the way it glanced, because it went all the way to the backstop and it was ball four. It was a three, two count. So it was funny because the national or the national broadcast, the television broadcast was kind of like, did it hit him? I don't know if it hit him and nobody argued it. He just took it and went down because I think it would have been ball or it would have been like it would have been four. ball four anyway. It would have been yeah. ball four anyway. But I thought it hit the knob of the bat the way it like ricocheted and went, but nobody complained. So he just took his base. Yeah. So, you know, now there is still only one out in the inning. <laughs> and now there are guys on second and third and then Mickey Moniak bunts and Kevin Pilar scores and now it's 3-3. And then Mickey Moniak steals. And then Michael Stefanik grounds out for the third out. Love that. So good. Now, again, when I say that Willie Calhoun just had his, had himself a day, so did Luis Renjifo. Basically, Willie Calhoun just, like, is he JV's daddy? Not really, but I think he had a multi hit day off of JV, didn't he? Yeah. I want to see that. Let's see. But I don't know that anyone would admit to being JV's daddy. Is May Kays is JV served up in his career? No, if anybody is JV's daddy that is on the Angels, it would be Logan O'Hobby. Logan Hoppy, have yourself a motherfucking day because he went four for five today. Dummy. We'll get there. We'll get there. Ren Hifo also had two hits. Will Calhoun had two hits. Kevin Ballard had two hits. Dummy. I hate the Angels. I just really hate anybody that's not the Astros. Let me just be very clear on that. Anyhow. So everything was going pretty well, right? Pretty well? I say pretty well. The bottom of the fifth JV is not looking great. Willie Calhoun singles again. And now it is four to three. And that's when Espada comes out and talks to him, essentially. And again, I like I said, I didn't watch it. But body language, Tom says, what, it, did did it look like JV told him? No, nah, I, I, this is my inning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So there were words exchanged, but I don't know that it wasn't. He, JV wasn't demonstrative with it. It wasn't like you're not taking this fucking ball for me. You know what I mean? Like we've seen Max Scherzer do or something like that. I think there was a conversation. It was like, look, I'm going to give you one more hitter and I'm going to give you a chance to get out of the inning. And if that doesn't happen, he had Seth Martinez warming. And that was key because I think that played a role into how far Seth Martinez would go into the game. And we'll get into that here in a second. But JV gets out of the inning and it's four to three angels. Yep. So he got Kevin Pillar to ground into a double play, and that was that was great. And then the beginning of the six, I didn't understand. Apparently, they were talking about it on the radio broadcast about Patrick Sandoval wanting the grounds crew to come out and repack the the mound or something. Is that what that was? Yeah, apparently the landing spot, I guess, wasn't to his liking. So they had them come out and fill it in. I don't know if JV had worn a spot or he had worn a spot, but for whatever reason. There was like, I don't know, like a two or three minute extra delay for them to like get the grounds in front of the mound. Right. Interesting. 
Yiner grounds out. Jake Myers strikes out. Mauricio Dubon singles. And then guess who comes up again? You'll never guess, guys. <laughs> Jose motherfucking Abreu comes up and hits a double. An RBI double, people. An RBI double. And for the people that talk the trash, the people that talk the shit, it was, a, it was an inside pitch that he pulled down the third base line and it rattled around all the way in the corner and allowed Dubon to score from first base. It left the bat at 106 miles an hour, guys. It came in at 88 miles an hour. So it's not like it's a fastball that supplied the power. Jose Abreu supplied the power on that. All right. So now the score's tied. It's tied four to four. And we battled back. We battled back. And how often have we said this season that it seemed like once we were down and that was it? There was no fight. We fought today. And unfortunately, <laughs> we didn't fight hard enough. But <laughs> then Chaz doubled like that. We love that. And Ooh, I didn't even see that. Those pitches that apparently that Chaz doubled on, it was a slider blown away. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a strike, y'all. That was beautiful. Spit on one, swung on one, spit on the second one, and then hit the third one. That's beautiful. Hooray! And then, oh, I was like, why did I miss this? Because I was in the middle of purchasing a shirt during this run. That's great. So the score is five four. And then Jose Altuve did Jose Altuve things on the first pitch. Of course it was on the first pitch. Uh, on a 85 mile an hour slider. You hang it, we bang it, baby. And that left the bat at 103.2 miles an hour and it went 406 feet. Jose Altuve, you are a monster. And now the score is 7-4. Seven 7-4. To four. Seven to four. I was like, we got this. We got this. And that is when, that's when the baseball gods said, Susie, We've already told you, you should not be a cocky bitch. I haven't learned my lesson, apparently, yet this season. Because I said, oh, seven four. We, we got past the five, guys. We got past the five. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Baseball God said, fuck you, Susie. No, absolutely not. Because then Alex Bregman got hit by a pitch. And then it was the same hand that he got hit a couple of days ago. But he stayed in the game a couple of days ago. He left the game after, what? In the next inning, he left the game. And then Mauricio Dubon came in to play third base. I need you to listen to me when I tell you Mauricio Dubon came in to play third base. Gold Are glove. You still Go gold glove. glove. Mauricio Dubon. Now, remember, people, remember what he normally plays? Remember? Second base, shortstop. And because for and because for some odd reason, people are like, oh my God, he's such a good outfielder. Outfielder. How often has he played third? I think only once. Yep. Although I do remember when people were griping about Alex Bregman earlier this season, they said, let's put Alex Dubon, Mauricio Dubon in because we need his bat. We need his bat. But do we also need his defense people? I think we take for granted how good Alex Bregman actually is at the hot corner. I think we actually take it for granted a lot because. Not just one error today, guys. Not just one. Do dose errors. I don't know how to say errors in Spanish, but if I knew how to, I would say it in Spanish. And one error, eh, two errors. The last error directly affected the score of this game, guys. Many fingers are going to be pointed. Many fingers, but possibly one of the biggest ones is going to be at Mauricio Dubon. It is going to be at Mauricio Dubon because, and I feel bad because I want to say earlier in the game, he slid and they said that he came up wincing. Do you, did you see that Tom? Dubon? No, not that. Okay. So at some point in time, I guess he, he slid and he came up wincing and I don't know what actually happened because they didn't say anything else. So I wonder if the two errors happened because he was hurt, possibly because he's not a third baseman. The second and part. For as, <laughs> yeah. And for as much as we love to pronounce him so good at all the spots, uh, that's what happens when you're a jack of all trades and master of none. Y this shit happens. So the so, first error 
he just didn't get down fast enough. It was a hot shot. And I know he didn't take any ground balls at third base because the switch happened so fast. He was actually coming out of the dugout to go to left field and somebody had to flag him down and bring him in. And for that, like that time, kind of like normally you're throwing the ball around, whatever. He didn't get any of that. Did so the- he, do you have to, do you have a different glove at third than you do for outfield? Oh yeah. The glove for outfield is a bigger glove. Is second and third the same size glove? Because I know first is a different glove. Yeah. Two, right? Okay. Yeah. Sec- second, short, and third are all the same glove or no? I would think so. I'm sure different players do different things, but that glove is going to be probably a little bit smaller. You're probably going to be more handsier. They're not going to have the big webbing that you would have in an outfield glove. And then the first baseman's glove's got that big thumb area, whatever. I don't want to say like a catcher, but a catcher. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that the ball is going to find you because legitimately the first play – Logan O'Hoppy reaches because Mauricio Dubon did the error. And I was like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I get it. I get it. Again, not a normal third baseman. He is our util guy, whatever. And then, so some first and Seth Martinez comes in and Seth Martinez has been so good for us guys has been so good for us. What was the last time he pitched though? So I don't think he had pitched since like Wednesday, but I think the fact that they had him get up, sit down, then get up, then sit down. I think that had something to do with why he only got 15 pitches. Cause they had him warm twice. The, the, when JV did, when JV got out of the inning, Seth Martinez was warming. So then they bring him in the next inning. And I think that had something to do with why, cause that inning, if you remember, they scored all the runs. So I, I imagine he was out there throwing a lot, trying to stay loose because that was a prolonged half of an inning. And then he gets the first two outs and they pull him from Montero. And I'm like, so again, he gets the, f- so the field, the fielding error happens by Mauricio Dubon. Then he strikes out Nolan Shanuel and then strikes out Zach Neto. So we still have a runner on guys. And if you've listened to this podcast, you will know that we believe Rafael Montero is best suited in a clean inning when there's no runners on. No when there's runners, when there's runners on, it's a whole different Rafael Montero Jr. It's a whole different one. And I tweeted that. And Larry the GM tweeted at me. Me too. And said that the splits apparently against Seth Martinez. Ex Woba. That oh. was the stat. Okay. Ex Woba, Seth Martinez versus who was the batter? I can't think of his name. Moniac. Mickey Moniac was 375. Ex-Woba. So X Woba is expected weighted on base average. It's a nerd stat. Don't get it twisted. I know it's a nerd stat, but it's also Mickey Moniak, who I don't think Mickey Moniak has a batting average above 200. Or if it is, it's very low. Let me fact check myself before I say anything else. <laughs> guess what guys mickey moniak has a batting average of 167 67 so you mean to tell me that he's gonna turn into jordan alvarez against seth martinez not for me i don't know now granted in that in those two at bats with shanuel and Neto, he was a little wild don't get me wrong he was a little wild it, it wasn't i guess normal quote-unquote seth martinez he wasn't as locked in as i I guess assumed that he would be. So I was like, maybe that's why he got pulled. But it was, I, I was very confused why, why he got pulled with a runner on, with his pitch count as low as it was. And Rafael Montero Jr. comes up and almost immediately, <laughs> I say almost immediately, one, two, oh, guess what? Six. On the sixth pitch, hangs a changeup, middle changeup. We can't throw it there, people. Cannot throw a 91 mile an hour changeup middle. Because guess what? That run scored. That run scored. And then Yainer Diaz helped Rafael Montero out by getting Mickey Monac at second. Throw down. It was beautiful. Love that. Caught stealing. Yay. But if that didn't happen, pretty sure that more runs would have scored in that inning. So the bottom of the six, the score is 75. We're still leading. 
you're still leading. And I'm like, okay, that's all right. Like, that's, <laughs> we, there's two runs. We're still good. Okay. So then the top of the seventh, Jeremy Pena grounds out. Yanir Diaz singles. Jake Myers doubles. Guess what, guys? Guess what? We got runners on second and third, baby. Second and third. With only one out. And what do you think happens? What do you think happens, guys? Do you think we scored? Do you think we, we could tack on any sort of runs? Mr. We always put the ball in play. Mauricio Dubon. What did Mauricio Dubon do? Didn't put the ball in play. Did not put the ball in play. Popped out. So that's two outs. And then Jose Abreu came come up. And I was like, that's the face I made, literally. So if you're not on the YouTubes, go look at the YouTubes. Because this was the face that I made. With two on and two out, this is the face I made. Even with all the things that he has done <clears throat> already in the game, at no point in time am I comfortable with Jose Abreu with runners in scoring position and getting those runners home. I wasn't happy because he lined out to left field and we stranded second and third with one out. Because of course we did. But guess what, guys? We're still up. We're still up. That's, all, that's okay. That's okay. That's right. That's okay. And then Brian Abreu comes on. Brian Abreu's arm is going to fall off. Tom, when is Brian Abreu's arm going to fall off? Probably timber. That makes me so sad. His arm is going to literally fall off. He's been used more than any reliever in any on any of the teams in any one innings. Is that what I heard today? 31 innings that he's thrown? That's, That's a ridiculous cra- amount. That's not crazy, though. He's probably going to pitch like 100 innings when the season's over. And that's like normal bullpen wear and tear. However, is it though? Because most of the time when he's coming in, it's high leverage situations. It's not clean innings. There's more adrenaline there. And he was everywhere today. And I was like, oh, all right. Sure. Brian Abreu. Let's. And then Luis Renhifo got hit by a pitch. And then line out, hit by pitch, force out, walk, strike out. That is what Brian Abreu did. But we're still up. We're still up seven to five. And I said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But in my head, I was like, that's not Seth good. Martinez, Seth Martinez came in. We're still up. Who's going to pitch the eighth if Brian Abreu pitched the seventh? Now, did we forget to tell you in Hunter Brown's game when it was six to one, Ryan Presley came in? Got roughed up. And if, again, if you're not on the YouTubes, you should go to the YouTubes because when I tell you that Ryan Presley came in a six to one game, my head did the puppy dog questioning thing that didn't give up any runs in that outing, but he threw 30 ish pitches. Enough. Enough that he probably shouldn't have pitched today. Now, if you are a Ryan Presley can do no wrong because Ryan Presley is America's closer and he's the greatest postseason closer of all time you should close your ears because you're not going to like what i say but if you are a ryan presley not truther if you are just aware of who ryan presley is as a pitcher then you <clears throat> should know that ryan presley is 15 pitches 15 pitches on day one 15 pitches on day one it's no stress it's no stress ryan presley's got that that's easy that's easy it should be most of the time most of the time most of the time Anything after 15 pitches on the first day that he pitches gets a little bit more stressful. Turns into Ryan Stressley. (laughs) But for the most part, typically can get out of it. But then on the second day, on the second day, if he is gone past 18 pitches, 18 pitches is really the limit. Really the limit. 18 pitches. If he's gone past 18 pitches on the first day, the second day when he comes in, now your asshole is sweating. It's puckered. All your orifices are puckered. You are just hoping and praying that it is you get Ryan Presley and not Ryan Stressley. So the fact that he came in yesterday, and I asked yesterday, I'm like, it's a 6-1 to game. I don't understand why he's up. Tweeted it out. And and people told me that it's because Ryan Presley needs the work. And I was like, does he though? Does he? Maybe we save Ryan Presley for, I don't know, a time when we actually need Ryan Presley. Because guess what? We don't have any days off in between now and the the Giants series. And we're going to tell you about Elliot Ramos here in a minute and Jorge Soler, but we'll be there. So the fact that he pitched in a six to one game when he didn't really need to. And like Seth Dubin was already Seth, Sean, Sean Dubin. I was like, why does that sound weird? Sean Dubin had already warmed. And again, people, it's a six to one game. Sean Dubin had already warmed. He could have gone in yesterday, Sean Dubin. And then maybe today, 
we get Ryan Presley instead of Ryan Stressley. So I'm the other way. I would have rather Ryan Presley worked yesterday and Dubin worked today because Dubin has proven he can get guys out at the major league level. I would have had no issue with Dubin going into that game and working that inning and giving Presley time to get right. The last couple times out, we've gotten Stressley. And I think that's a confidence thing for him because four days ago he closed and it was like, no problem. It was lights out. Yes. It was lights out. But for whatever reason, that eighth inning, it's a mental fog. Like he's middle, he's throwing get over pitches. He doesn't have good command of that, that curveball or that slider that he throws that hard slider that's back foot to left-handed hitters. I think he needs to work low leverage some in the eighth inning to just get his sea legs. Now I know he's a veteran. He's been around a long time, but when you look at Ryan Presley in the eighth inning, it's a totally different animal than when you look at him in the ninth inning and he's got less room to work with. So yesterday comes in, he gets into some trouble. They end up having to get him out of the trouble. I think Abreu came in to cover him right yesterday's game because the bases were loaded and there was a whole thing today. There was no one to cover him. So you were just along for the ride with Ryan Presley and then in the end, they had to go to Justin Hader. Wow. Josh Hader. Josh Hader. Josh all Hader. the days. Josh Hader, because he'd already given up the he'd already given up the lead. It was a tie game at that point. So for me, I just I feel like Espada did a horrible job managing this whole situation. The Montero thing, Montero has been horrible with inherited runners. Last year, 50% of everybody he inherited scored. That's not- Ryan Presley finished his inning yesterday. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but, Ryan Presley finished his, finished his inning. But there was trade, traffic. But... There was traffic yesterday. That's why I got the 30 pitches. Yeah. I think, Abreu had traffic too. And I know these are your guys that you're saying, hey, we got to win with these guys. But if you can't trust Sean Dubin, then you need bullpen help. Went to Taylor Scott. The Astros went to Taylor Scott yesterday to finish the game off. Maybe you save him. Maybe you should have went to Montero there. Yeah, so Rafael Montero came in the bottom of the seventh, ground out, fly out, home run, and then walked Renjifo on six pitches. And then Brian Abreu, that was last night's game, or yeah, yeah. last night's game, Brian Abreu had to come in and cover Rafael Montero. Yeah. But then walked back-to-back batters and then got Zach Neto to ground out. And I tweeted out, at some point in time, I would just love a stress-free ball game. Is that too much to ask? Because I'm going to start sending my colorist, Bill, to the Astros to cover up all the gray hairs that y'all are giving me. Oh, we didn't even talk about Ben Joyce and how awesome Jordan and Jeremy Pena and Yiner Diaz are, but we'll come back. We will give flowers after we dissect this last game. But yeah, the game yesterday gave up a single line out, strike out, single wild pitch. So there were r- runners on First and second, excuse me, second and third. (laughs) Runners on second and third, and then he struck out Nolan Shanuel. It shouldn't be that hard, people. It should not be that hard. It should be one, two, three. Maybe not one, two, three, because he's not a robot. (laughs) I get it. I understand. But it shouldn't be stress. It shouldn't be stressly. It shouldn't be stressful like that. And my thing is, if you're 10 games over 500, you're in first place, maybe you give, maybe you run him out there back to back going, okay, I need to build confidence that way. But in the situation the Astros are in, where every game matters, you feel like this one is one that a spot has got to find a way to see out. The Astros scored seven runs. And, that should be enough. And that, that should be enough. And there were multiple leads, 7-4 and 7-5, late in that game, where you go, okay, I've got to lean wherever I've got to lean so that I'm not in extras, I'm not getting walked off in the ninth, give my closer a chance to close this game out. And if anybody wants to go at Josh Hader for giving away, giving up that, that walk off, you're just doing it wrong because he had to come in to, to get out of the eighth inning. And I feel like when you ask a closer for more than three outs multiple times, which what are we on? Like the fourth time, I think. So it's like the sixth. It's the yeah. fifth or sixth time now. Yeah. You're just, you're asking so much from Josh Hader to sit down, then relock in when all we've done is tell you that closers to include Ryan Presley are weird creatures and they have certain habits and instincts. Yeah, yeah. So Josh has been amazing at getting you four, five, six outs. And I think 
if Cabbage makes that catch, they probably get out of that inning too. Yeah. So let's, before we, hold on. Ryan Presley comes in the bottom of the eighth in this game today. And Logan O'Hoppy immediately on the second pitch that Ryan Presley throws, which is a 93 mile an hour dick high fastball, guys. Can't, you can't throw it there. We cannot throw it there. Legitimately, it is in the middle box, people. <laughs> when I say middle, I legitimately mean middle. Go to the YouTubes. I'm pointing. You will see it. And Logan O'Hoppy had himself a motherfucking day and hits a ground rule double. Love that. Nolan Chanuel, he gets a strikeout. Let's see. How many pitches? Four. Four pitches. And then Zach Neto doubles. And now the score is seven to six. And I'm all. Didn't have to be. Hmm. That's not great. I don't love that. But it's fine. We still have a lead. It's okay. It's okay. And now I'm the meme with the fire and the dog. And I'm saying it's fine. It's fine with the fire and the dog. That's me. That's where I am mentally at this point. And then Ryan Presley throws a wild pitch. And I was like, why, Ryan Presley? Why? Don't do that. That's not great. And then we move the runner from second to third. And then Mickey Moniak walks on six pitches. Excuse me, five pitches. And when I tell you that none of these things are close, one. Literally one touched the strike zone. Go to the YouTubes, guys. Go to the YouTubes and look and see where those pitches are. Pitch five hit the top of the strike zone. Three of those are at his feet. What are we doing? Why? Ryan Presley, I understand you've got all the spin in the world. And maybe you were like, oh, maybe I shouldn't throw it middle. Let's try to throw it in the strike zone then. Strike zone then. And then Michael Stefanik grounds out. And now we are tied seven to seven. And that particular play, you feel really bad for Presley because it was like a check swing, like an excuse me, just oops. And it was so poorly hit that there was no play other than, than a, just a routine play to first. And it was almost like a bunt that just worked out like a swinging bunt. Yeah, right. it was below the zone. It was below the zone and it left the bat at 57 miles an hour, 56.6 miles an hour. But that's not great. That's not great. And I get it. I get the BABIP is a stat for a reason. Because luck does play a part in all of this. I don't know if Ryan Presley stepped on leprechauns or destroyed a leprechaun's house. And now they have it out for Ryan Presley because Ryan Presley has had an inordinate amount of bad luck in a lot of his innings. And I just, I, I don't know. Maybe someone needs to do the cleansing on Ryan Presley. So whereas Ryan Presley is booted all, can you just stop it? Please and thank you. That'd be great. I don't really even think it's that. I think he makes these situations where, Worst like you said, no, he started the inning clean. So it wasn't like he came in with inherited runners. And you throw middle, major league hitters are going to hit middle. And I'm sure he didn't intend to. He would tell you he probably want the ball two inches this way, two inches that way. But... You want to miss like on the edge. Everybody needs an extra couple inches. Okay. Two inches matters. People. So the back-to-back -back doubles were middle. And I, and at, at the end of this game, I put this loss on Joe Espada. And the reason I put it there is because Presley shouldn't have been in that game. In my opinion, if you threw 30 pitches the day before and you had an entire bullpen minus, minus Brian Abreu that you could have went to go use those guys. Go use Dubin. Go do you Sean Dubin and go, okay, he's gotten outs for me. I trust this guy to go get me three outs and give him a clean inning and let him go to work. The fact that however, you you're not paying those guys to get you those outs. You're paying Ryan Presley to get you those outs. And for as much as I want to say, Ryan Presley should not be pitching because in my brain, I know that my heart knows that, but my brain says I pay this guy to go pitch whenever I tell him to go pitch. It doesn't matter that he pitched yesterday. He Susie. should be able to pitch today. I Susie. know. Susie, you can't on one side of the spectrum go, I don't give a shit what we pay Jose Abreu. Uh, that cost is already gone. And go, just bring me the motherfucker that can hit. And then on the other side of the spectrum go, but we pay Ryan Presley to make these outs. We need him to make, I don't want anybody else. I want Ryan Presley. You oh, no, I'm not saying I want Ryan Presley. I'm just saying that Ryan Presley should be able to make these outs no, regardless of back-to-back -back days or whatever. True, but in the same vein that you go, okay, Jose Abreu's not right. Let me try Big John. 
Let me try Joey Loprofito. Let me try Dubon. We'll try all these guys at first base. The eighth inning doesn't have to be Ryan Presley. It doesn't for me. It can be the seventh inning. Abreu can be the eighth inning guy. It can be Sean Dubin. It can be like, okay, we'll move Presley down in the lineup, a la Abreu, Bregman, all those guys when they were struggling. You know what I mean? Like, it does not have to be he was the closer, now he's the setup guy, and no one else can pitch that inning. Now, if you're worried about that, and some people are, and some people think that's disrespectful to Ryan Presley, then you need to trade his ass and let him go close wherever he needs to go close and get back to work because he's not helping himself and he's not helping the Astros doing these eighth inning stress lease. That, that's what they're affectionately called now. And like la- yesterday, I was totally for him pitching in a six to one ball game to go out there and have success in the eighth inning to feel good about, Hey, I'm the setup guy. I'm going to come in here, mow these cats down. And this is what I do. And just to get comfortable today, I thought it was the worst decision you could make because he threw so many pitches yesterday. You needed him to go in there based on the work that he did yesterday and get in there and get three outs on 15 pitches. Anything more than that, and you were going to cook him. And then you were going to need someone else because if it got 20, 25, now you're talking 50, 60 pitches in two days. Really tough. It's not great. It's not great. And then Josh Hader has to come in. And so now you've just cooked his confidence even more. Because he was never that guy last season, the season before that. Like, he was the guy coming in and mopping up shit. Not other people having to come in and mop up his shit. And so now I think it's just in his head even more so than than normal, than necessary. Honestly, I think there is some, as fucked up as it is, I think there is some truth to the whole, he needs to be a closer and he just, he can't get it up unless he's the closer. If we're really going to, if we're really going to talk about it, he needs that extra adrenaline boost. He needs that extra whatever it is in that ninth inning. Because when he came and closed four days ago, you saw it. He was that, the Johnny Cash ring of fire. He was that guy again. It doesn't have the same energy in the eighth inning. And co-closers, everybody gets the rest. He's older. Josh Hader's older. Everybody gets the rest. Sean Dubin. It, it, you can have like multiple eighth inning guys. Okay. Brian Abreu, Sean Dubin. Hell, I'll even put Taylor Scott out there. Taylor Scott has been a fireman. He, he needs the fireman song for him to come in whenever the fuck he a spotted because he's been great. Taylor Scott in the eighth, put Taylor Scott in the seventh. Do the cold closers for Hader and Presley. I know we're paying Hader five million gajillion trillion dollars, but let them co close. They I don't, don't like need it. to be, they don't need to be closing on back to back days either. I don't like it. I think you have the one and you just either the guy can do it or he can't, or you move him because the, okay, well, who closes then? How do you, how does, if they're both rested, if everybody's got a day off, how do you pick the closer? If they're co-closers on where you are in the lineup on analytics, we're going to go. And then everything else, the first time that Presley doesn't close, Hater would have had it. First time that Hater doesn't close, Presley would have had it. It's well, not, it's, is it any better or worse than what we're doing now? I think it is worse. I think is if you identify the one and everybody knows that's the one, Hater doesn't have a problem closing baseball games. It's when you ask him to do more than that that you get this shit. You know what I mean? I think he's got one blown save on the year. He, he doesn't have a problem closing games with leads. It's, hey, we fucked up. Can you come fix it for us? And then it's, and then like, how far do I go? Like, I'm going to try. Gosh. And I'm like, man, you're a soldier, bro. Cause we're not giving you opportunities to close with leads. And then we're constantly asked. I think he's got as many save opportunities as he does. You know, hold opportunities. That stuff's stupid. That I will I actually, I will actually look that up. Somebody, but remind me, somebody put that in the YouTube comments and be like, Susie, fact check like, this. Like, I, I want to know, because I feel like. You're going to look at that and go, damn, I can't be mad at Josh. Yeah. Okay. So let's then let's talk about what, what had happened. So it's now tied seven to seven on the Michael Stefanik ground out. And then Josh Hader comes in and what should have been a routine play Mauricio Dubon boots again. The fact that there was even more traffic that should have been like that right there. The inning should have ended right there, but unfortunately it did not. So then Luis Renjifo, Gets to second, and then Josh Hader has to 
throw six more pitches to Taylor Ward. And Taylor Ward is their RBI leader, I want to say. He's the Angels' RBI leader on their team. Very dangerous hitter. It is not a low-stress situation. It's not a walk in the park. Those are high-leverage pitches that he is having to make. Then he has to sit down. And do we tie, or excuse me, do we give any sort of insurance runs? No. Jeremy Pena lines out. Yiner Diaz strikes out on three pitches. And Jake Myers grounds out in four pitches. And now Josh Hader has to come back in. Joe Adele flies out on one pitch. I'm like, one pitch, one out. Whew, good. We're good. We're good. Okay. We got this. Maybe. Hopefully. And then Kevin Pillar singles on a pitch that was almost below the zone. And I was like, okay, that's fine. That's okay. Now, I don't know if you guys know that Kevin Pillar is Mike Trout Light. incarnate. Literally, it's Mike Trout on the inside. He's just wearing a Kevin Pillar suit, like meat suit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you guys know that or not. But if you literally put Kevin Pillar's stats next to Mike Trout's stats without any names, you'd be very surprised, guys. Now Kevin Pillar is on. And then Logan motherfucking Ohapi hits a home run. And if you didn't see this play, you guys need to go and see this play because I feel so badly for Trey Cabbage. Because if Trey Cabbage had been able to maintain this ball in his glove, he would have never had to buy a drink in Houston ever fucking again. It was amazing. Think Chaz level catch against the fence in the World Series. He had to go into the crowd. And I thought he had it. I honestly thought he had it. He did. And then when he rolled over and hit the fence, like to brace himself, he lost it. Yeah. He made the catch. I need to put some like Velcro or something on those, on the end of, ends of those gloves to keep it closed. I realize that's not an actual thing that people can do. Okay. I know ball a little bit, but it was very unfortunate. That's how this game ended. If I had a dick, it would have been just a straight up kick to the dick. The guys know, guys who've been hit there, they know. That that feeling in their belly, that like gross, I'm going to vomit feeling. All guys know. All guys have had some level of kick in the dick at some point in time. Mm -hmm. If they haven't, they're lying to you. All all guys know. So that <clears throat> it wasn't great. And I was like, oh, that's beautiful. That's so great. Fucking Logan O'Hobby. I hate you. I don't actually hate you, Logan O'Hobby, but it wasn't great. And I was like, you're the angels. Can you just stop? What are you playing for? Nothing. Just stop it. But they didn't. They didn't because they stole a game. They stole a game. And quite honestly, when your offense goes out and scores seven runs, bullpen should be able to maintain that shit. However, when your bullpen is immensely overworked, maybe they're tired. Josh Hader has nine saves and 10 save chances. Josh Hader has had 26 games in relief. Do the math, people. That's math that math ain't mathing. That math ain't mathing. Okay. It was a disappointing game. It was a disappointing game. They now go to San Francisco to face the Giants. But before that, we have to give the flowers to Jordan Alvarez, Jeremy Pena, and Yiner Diaz. Why, you ask? Let me tell you. This stat brought to you by Sarah Langs. If you guys don't follow Slangs on Sports on Twitter, you should. If you guys don't remember, Ben Joyce is an absolute flamethrower. The difference between Ben Joyce and Mason Miller, when I say pitch shape is a thing, pitch shape is a thing, people. The fact that Mason Miller absolutely destroyed the Astros when we faced him and we just teed off on Ben Joyce, there's a reason. And it's pitch shape. Okay. So this stat by Sarah Langs. Jordan Alvarez doubled off a 103.9 mile an hour pitch. Yainer Diaz singled off a 103.1 mile an hour pitch. It's the first time in the pitch tracking era a team has had multiple base hits on 103.0 uh, plus mile an hour pitches in a season, let alone a game or inning. I'm going to put this in the show notes so that you guys can read it and then really comprehend what amazing hitters Jordan Alvarez and, excuse me, Yonder Diaz are. I was like, wait, why isn't Jeremy Pena in here? Because Jeremy Pena hit Ben Joyce's slider, not his fastball, his slider. But Ben Joyce is, I think he was drafted last season. 
So he's still very young. He's still learning. And let's call a spade. The angel's development system, guys, is not great. So if he's going to learn pitch shapes, he's going to probably have to do it by himself in the offseason, maybe. Going to driveline or... Tread. What's the other one? Tread. He's going to have to go get some outside help to develop this so that he's not just a thrower, so that he can be a pitcher. And there's really not any veteran pitchers on the team that can help him, a la Justin Verlander. Angels fans are so mad at Ben Joyce. I don't understand why. It's not his fault. The kid can throw. The kid can throw. But there's only so far, there's only so much that he can actually do without any sort of from the organization. And again, the organization is not great. On the radio broadcast, they were talking about how many first round draft picks the Angels have. It's legitimately more than half the team. The fact that they're this, that the record is this bad, does that point to just a failure on all fronts? Or is it development? I don't know. I, I think it's tough when you have a team that is devoid of any veteran leadership. Like, you, we talk about the Astros all the time, like Tuve, Jordan, like Tuck now to an extent. These guys, they lead this team. When they perform well, the team plays well. If we had a team full of Yiners and Loperfitos and Cabbages, like Cabbage was an angel. It just didn't work out. I think it's really hard to find your footing, to have that, hey, I've seen this. Hey, this is this will help you. The mentorship, they're really just out there. Now, they brought in Ron Washington to help with that. But I think year one is always really tough because you're trying to get your feet settled in where you are. And then, okay, who am I working with? What can I do to make them better? I think it's a two, three-year process. Now, if they had Mike Trout and Anthony Rendon and Reed Detmers, who I don't think it's fair for Reed Detmers, but they had some pitching guys that, that I guess were good, solid veteran dudes, maybe – this wouldn't be so tough, but right now you're looking at a team that just does not have the pieces to be able to take a young guy like, like, like Ben Joyce under his wing and go, Hey, this is what you got to do kid. Or they'd be better. Yeah. So for all those that are pointing fingers, just maybe don't maybe point the finger at Artie Moreno. Do that. Yeah. That, that was a great stat by Sarah Langs and just flowers for your on. Flowers for Jeremy Pena. Flowers for Yiner. Because, again, looks like he's gotten locked back in. Fingers crossed. Hopefully. But let's talk about the Giants series, this upcoming series, that we will have. Do you have the probables? I can get there. Okay. You look up that. I will look up. Bregman's x-rays are negative, and he's day-to-day. The ball struck him on the bone on his wrist. I'm good. <laughs> I bet you he's sick of that. Probably. Here we go. Okay, so the West Coast Games make me tired, y'all. West Coast Games, Giants. Their orange is a different orange than ours, and it hurts my eyeballs. It's a bright orange. Really? For ours, yeah. Look at, I realize that oh, you can't oh, see there, the, there. Yeah, I realize the that actual... you guys can't see the shade, but yeah, it's a different orange. So tomorrow it looks like it's Spencer versus Kyle Harrison. Correct. And then and then Ronell versus Jordan Hicks. Should be good. That, that Jordan Hicks, good. the converted reliever, reliever. Mm-hmm. two starter, fireball thrower. And then Wednesday is Fromber versus Logan Webb. So our ground ball guy. Versus their ground ball guy. That will be very interesting. That will be a low scoring game. I think. I, although he's been hit around a little bit lately. So I don't know. Maybe he's a very superstitious guy. So if anybody in San Francisco can just go and ruin his routine that day, that'd be super awesome. Just saying. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> so let's see. The Giants just came off a winning series they just beat the rangers they lost to the diamondbacks and let's see they lost to the yankees they did however win against the phillies it's 
we shall see what happens with with the giants. Be very careful. Be very careful when you guys look at their players, though, because you're like, oh, we don't know these guys. These are all like no name guys. <laughs> don't underestimate them. Uh, Elliot Ramos, their center fielder who took the spot of Jung Hoo Lee. People are like, Jung Hoo Lee, who? We don't give a fuck. Because Elliot Ramos has come in and literally just lit the world on fire. So him and Patrick Bailey have basically been like holding all of the things down. All of them. But they are three and seven over the last 10. So they are struggling a little bit. They struggle all of the bits. Again, They're it's baseball. We don't know what's happening. Baseball is ba baseballing is what we really like to say. They are negative 28 in run differential. What's ours? Plus six. Oh, we're actually in the plus. Fun fact, the, the Mariners who lead the division, they are also plus six. Nice. The Astros have scored more runs than any other team in the division. And yet, do we lead? Absolutely not. All right, guys. So we're going to wrap it up with the standings because it's what I like to do. We are a full game back of the Rangers. So the Mariners still lead 37-30. The Rangers at 31 and 34, five games back. We are 30 and 35, six games back. Oakland is 26 and 41, 11 games back. And then the Angels are 24 and 40, 11 and a half games back. So, you know, only have a game from the worst team, you know. And then we're not going to talk about the wild card, guys. I, we're just going to talk about our division, okay? We still, there's still hope, maybe, hopefully. Hmm. I don't know. I guess what do you mean we'll you don't know? At the, at the end of June. At the end of June, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Maybe. Hopefully. Fingers crossed? No. They're fine. This what's, division... What's no. This, the whole maybe, hopefully... The division is very bad. Like, it's very bad. You just won two series this in a row, and we're fingers crossed, hopefully. Maybe. I don't know. Not me. I was worried that they were going to struggle with the Cardinals. They would beat the Cardinals. I felt like they should beat the Angels. They beat the Angels. Now you go get another series from the Giants. Seattle and Texas aren't going anywhere. So over the last 10, Seattle 6-4. and four. Texas 5-5. Five and five. Stroh 6-4. So you keep stacking 6-4, six 6-4, and 6-4. Six and six and I do believe there's a scenario by the end of June where they can run down the Mariners and the Rangers. They're only a game and a half of game and a half behind the Rangers. That can happen very fast. Texas is dealing with injuries equal to or greater than the Astros. The Mariners just absolutely cannot score. The Astros scored 40 more runs than the Mariners do. Side note, we love the Royals. We love them. Absolutely awesome. love the Royals. Because the Royals, you want to talk about battle back. Woo wee. If you want to see some good games, go watch last night's Mariners Royals game. The let me just tell you, the Royals were down seven to zero, seven to zero in the first inning. Before they got even up to bat, they were down seven to zero. Now, if the Astros were down seven to zero in the first inning, do you think we would have a chance to even come back? Maybe in seasons past, not this season. They battled back. At one point, they were down eight to zero, and they battled back and won that game with a walk off. Is it a triple by Bobby? I want to say it was a triple. It was a walk-off. I think their bases were loaded when he came up. I don't Regardless, know what... yeah. Bobby Wood Jr. is fucking fantastic. He's Go watch dead. that game. They were smart to sign um, him when they did. I want to say Camilla Duvall has not been doing great lately. Let's say his ERA is 3.91 and his whip is at 1.579. So he has... He's been giving up a, a few hits. So he's not as unhittable as he has, he, as he has been. Um, but still... a Amazing closer. So don't get it twisted. Um, but with that, we are going to close the show. So Tom, tell the peoples where they can find you on the interwebs. At Third Coast Tom on Twitter. It's where I do the majority of my socializing, shit talking, whatever you want to call it. At TC Tom one on Instagram. I occasionally dabble on the Instagram. It's not as much. It's not that I don't like it. It's just that Twitter seems like more fun. And then uh, on the PSF app. If you're not going to a ball game, no matter who you root for, I don't know why you'd be rooting for anybody other than the Astros in here, but on the wild chance that you root for somebody else and you are listening to us for slanderous purposes, <laughs> first, 
thank you for, for tuning in. We appreciate you. Secondly, get on the PSF app. If you're not at the game, you want to be with your fans, you want to be with your people, that's the place to do it. Doesn't matter what team you're rooting for. It doesn't matter what sport. They're moving it all around. Hockey, soccer, basketball, football, you name it. They've got a room for you to go speak your piece, be heard. If you want the best podcasting group in there, when we're on, that's normally us. You're going to have a good time, win, lose, or draw. And join the PSF app. They started this new peer-to-peer wagering system called Duels. It is very cool. It is very easy. You pick one stat. You pick your player. You pick another player. And whoever has the most of that stat wins. And it's a lot of fun. It's a way to put the money where your mouth is, so to speak. Come check us out. For sure. I will put all of those links in the show notes. If you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTubes. Why not? Please do. There's a big red button. Do that. We'd love that. If you haven't given us any five-star ratings or given us any of the nice words, please go do that on all of the platforms, Apple, Spotify, any of the other ones. Please, I beg of you, do that. All of the nice words, all of the good ratings, five stars. Pretty please. Por favor. There we go. Um, Great Britain, shout out to to you out there in Great Britain. I don't know where you came from or how you found us, but yay for you guys because you guys got us on the Great Britain Apple charts. We charted over there at 163, I believe. So United States fans, where the fuck are y'all? Okay, get come on now. Need to get up there. And with that, we are going to close the show and say yay baseball.